Thank you for joining us for Achieving Equity in Surgical and Hearing Healthcare. Brought to you by the American Neurotology Society and the American Audiological Society. A conversation about health equity with respect to access to and outcomes of surgical and hearing related care. Our keynote speaker is Dr. L.D. Britt. Our guest speakers, Dr. Anil Lalwani, Dr. Carrie Neiman. Our moderators are Dr. Stephanie Moody and Dr. Anna Kim. Without further ado, Dr. Stephanie Moody. in surgical and hearing health care. I want to start by thanking the ANS and the AOS for co-sponsoring this event. I'm very excited about our conversation tonight. Uh, we will have a conversation about achieving equity in surgical and hearing related health care. And so that we start off all on the same page, I want to define equity for tonight's discussion. Equity in health care is when everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. And in this case, it's going to be a conversation about having healthy hearing. We will discuss the impact of social determinants of health, barriers to advancing equity, and the role of the physician and other healthcare providers in defining and eliminating the disparities. We hope to inspire surgeons, audiologists, researchers, and everyone involved with the care of patients with hearing loss and other surgical care related to otology and neurotology uh, to work together towards a better understanding of disparities and the development of infrastructure and policy to reduce and eliminate those disparities. As a matter of housekeeping, uh, please uh, consider comments and questions and add them to the comments area of whichever um, site that you are uh, viewing this um, conversation. Our keynote speaker tonight is Dr. L.D. Britt, Endowed Chair of Surgery at the Eastern Virginia Medical School. Giving him due credit for his service to surgical care and education in surgery would take much more time than we have tonight, but I will hit a few highlights for you. He completed his education and training at University of Virginia, uh, Harvard School of Medicine, and Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Britt is a paragon of an academic surgeon with more than 300 publications and four textbooks to his name. He's internationally recognized for his expertise in teaching, He's held more than 200 invited visiting professorships, and he's been awarded several of the nation's highest teaching awards in medicine, including the Glazier Distinguished Teaching Award from the Association of American Medical Colleges. His leadership roles in the field of surgery and surgical education are almost innumerable. He served as chairman for the ACGME Residency Review Committee and has held the role of president in many different uh, societies, including the Society of Surgical Chairs, the American College of Surgeons, and the American Surgical Association, among several others. Other important roles include terms as Commissioner of the Joint Commission and Director of the American Board of Surgery. Dr. Britt's dedication to public service has been recognized with many prestigious awards, including election to the National Academy of Medicine and the U.S. Surgeon General's Medallion. He's been awarded three honorary doctorates, and um, has also um, been elected a uh, fellow to four of the Royal Colleges of Surgeons in the UK, among several others. Dr. Britt is a native of Suffolk, Virginia, and um, despite his international prestige, uh, he remains very active in his own community. He has a longstanding interest in disparities in education and in health, and he tackles these topics both locally and with a national agenda. Uh, he was recipient of an NIH grant uh, that we'll learn about uh, tonight um, to determine disparity sensitive measures um, that can be used to develop targeted interventions aimed at eradicating disparities and improving outcomes. Uh, Dr. Britt, it's an honor to have uh, you here with us tonight. And with that, I will pass the floor on to you. Thank you, Dr. Moody, for that introduction. If I could have my first slide. You know, achieving equity in surgical health care um, is difficult. Next slide. We have been on a long journey. Next slide. But it's been eventful. Next slide, please. If you look at the greatest challenges facing this country, you have to include health care disparities as one. And if you talk about health care disparities, you can't obviously have equity. Next slide. 
Next slide. You know, Martin Luther King had a lot of quotes, but my favorite is one is, of all the forms of inequality, injustice and help is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Well, he would be obviously shocked today because of disparity and inequality is still very prominent. Next slide. Next slide. As we raise the curtain on American medicine, next slide. We would like to have no disparities. That's the purpose of this, this, this symposium, to try to find a way to, to make the playing field level. Next slide. So the, the healthcare disparities, growing disparities in all the specialties. Next slide. And as the, the American population grows, that's 25 million per decade, uh, as people get older, the disparities will get more. Next. At EVMS, we realized that women, when they had childbirth, they had the chances of their children dying and the, the, the woman dying uh, in delivery. Next slide. And what we realized was was stunning with 5.7 deaths per thousand live births in the United States has an infant mortality rate. And black babies are in the greatest danger with an infant mortality rate in 2018 of 10.8 deaths per thousand live births compared to 4.6 for white babies. Next slide. And we realized that obviously the, what changed is that if we have a provider a black provider providing the care, it cuts it dramatically. Next slide. And so as you see here, when black doctors, doctors delivered babies, their mortality rate was more than half. From 430 per 100,000 live births to 173 per 100,000. Next slide. It is the first empirical evidence to describe the impact of the physician's race on an outcome such as infant mortality. So it's an essential component if you want to achieve equity. Next slide. Well, my NIH grant that Dr. Moody mentioned is looking at ways to be able to define disparities and find sensitive metrics, validate those metrics, and try to put together a strategy to mitigate it. Next slide. Uh, this means we have to have expert panels. We call them Delphi rounds to be able to validate and determine the disparities. Next slide. Next slide. And then to determine the feasibility of candidate metrics and achieve consensus on a suite of the disparity sensitive metrics for access over the five phases of surgical care. And that could be the same with medical care. Next slide. Well, here's one of the, the, the symposium, the summit that we had with my co investigators uh, from all over the country. Next slide. And what we're getting down to, and we're ready to publish, some of the sensitive uh, disparity metrics that we need to now put together a strategy for to mitigate. Next slide. Next slide. As I've often said, people talk about quality, and quality is important, but there is no quality without access. Next slide. If you look at the mild alignment, let's go with you know, 2,420 medical schools. You have no medical schools in 36 countries. In the sub-Saharan African countries, there's only one or no medical school. Next slide. And so here's the situation. This is the this is the, the 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 frame that I want you to look at. You have 47 million or more uninsured, far exceeds the seven million that sometimes touted. But the one the one line I want you to, to see, next slide is that 45,000 people die each year because they're, they're uninsured. Now, you can't talk about equity if that's the case. Next slide. So in other parts of the world, next slide, you have some alarming facts. Because I would like to make this a more of a global talk. Obviously, I'm concerned about the United States, but look at globally. Next slide. One third of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. I can't buy a Starbucks coffee for less than $2 a day. Next slide. And one continent is responsible for only 1% of the world health care uh, 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 expenditures. That's Africa. Next slide. We spend the most. Our expenditures in the United States continue to go up. Next slide. And while we look for a new curriculum to try to define a way and have an educational curriculum to try to address this, we have been unsuccessful. Next slide. We need to overhaul the American healthcare system, similar to what Steve Jobs did for communication. 
and technology. Right now, I bet you everybody out there has an iPhone or some sort of uh, 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 handheld. We need to have the same overhaul in the American healthcare system if we're going to achieve equity. Next slide. Well, the great journey, next slide. And we have expectations and challenges. Next slide. I call them headwinds and, and tailwinds. Well, there's a trio that was announced that they were going to try to find a way to simplify healthcare, make it high quality, transparent, and have a reasonable cost. They're trying to achieve equity for their employees. Next slide. The, 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 the people, next slide. Their companies, and this is Bezos and, and, and obviously uh, Warren Buffett and, and Jamie Dimon, their companies had a combined revenues of a half a trillion dollars and employed more than 1.1 million people. Now, again, what they're trying to do is achieve equity for their cohort of, 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 of employees. Next slide. And they were trying to create a healthcare system that is free from profit uh, making incentives and constraints. Next slide. And if you look at it, you know, the most valuable brands, there, there's a reason why you don't see a healthcare system because that's not a valuable brand. It's certainly not a successful brand when it comes to equity. Next slide. So why is the integrated health system not one of the most valuable brands? Well, again, once we achieve equity, maybe it will be, but right now there's, we're not even close. Next slide. Next slide. If you look at the, what, 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 what we waste money, we have too many unproven procedures, overpriced drugs and devices, overwhelming administrative overhead, lack of effort to address extravagant inefficiencies. One out of every $3 is squandered on unnecessary unproven procedures and devices. So when people uh, tout that, well, we need money to be able to get equity, that's not true. We have enough money in the system. It's just, it's just not used well. Next slide. The 2015 study published in the Harvard Business Review reported that clinical waste, administrative complexity, excessive prices, all the things I highlighted earlier, and then fraud and abuse amount to 40% of the total U.S. healthcare spending. Next slide. So Warren Buffett, next slide, in his own way, said ballooning calls of healthcare act as a hungry tapeworm on the American economy. Next slide. And he said, our group does not come to this problem with answer, but we do not accept it as inevitable. Next slide. And next slide. Now, Dr. Mr. Bezos of Amazon, next slide, talked about we enter into this challenge again. They're all being open-eyed eyed about the degree of difficulty. Next slide. But at the end of the day, they want to be able to find something that's a long-term success to require talented experts and all of that, but a different overhaul in the system. Next slide. And Jamie Dimon put it very simply. Next slide. To try to create a healthcare system that costs less and get better results. And he didn't say this, but it's implied is has equity that is well distributed. Next slide. Next slide. Well, you we look at the responsibilities of the medical profession. People say, well, this is beyond our scope. Well, it's not beyond your scope. Your first responsibility, next slide, is excellent patient outcomes. Then wise resource allocation, which obviously is not the case as I highlighted, and effective self-regulation, which we were doing a poor job. Next slide. Next slide. The overarching question at the end of the day, when we talk about equity, next slide. What kind of value does the United States receive for all this healthcare expenditures? Well, I told you the amount. Next slide. And we talk about outcomes. Next slide. If we look at what we're ranked, forget the, the left column about access to basic knowledge, health and wellness and equity. We're 68. We're behind Peru, Panama. Netherlands, Ethiopia, that's unacceptable for the money we spend. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So for all the spending and testing, life expectancy of the United States is the lowest of all the industrialized countries. Next slide. So if this, this graphic shows that we're not getting a good value uh, for it's the health dollars that we spend, in fact, it should be, it's predicted that we should be living to 81, 81.4 uh, years and uh, actually with about five marks below that. Next slide. 
Next slide. Next slide. Poor distribution of dollars. I can't say it enough. We have enough money in the system. Next slide. And what is even more concerning and, and, and compounds the problem of equity, if you look at why people die prematurely, only 10%, next slide, next slide, is due to healthcare. Most of it is due to obviously a social determinants. So right now we're spending about $4.35 trillion. Next slide. Next slide. Money, more money will not solve the problems in healthcare. Next slide. So the challenges, next slide. As Institute of Medicine, which is now the National Academy of Medicine, they said, and, and then this will highlight the theme of this symposium. Next slide. Next slide, please. It has to be safe, the aims, it has to be effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. Well, we'll get to equitable because that's the theme of this symposium. Next slide. We're concerned that it's not safe. Next slide. If you look at the focus, next slide. Safe and healthcare disparities, two problems that we have a tendency to forget. Maybe not healthcare disparities, but certainly safety. Next slide. If you look at industrialized nations like Australia, Canada, Germany, New Zealand, U UK, and United States, if you're in six and you're in gold, which is United States, that's, that's the lowest score. Next slide. Next slide. And so they're saying that we're six for safe care. We'll get to equity in a minute. Next slide. We need to improve healthcare. We need to make it safer. Next slide. If you look at surgical never events, we have 4,000, over 4,000 events per year. And I'm talking about retained objects, wrong site, wrong procedure, and wrong patient. Next slide. And so wrong procedure, wrong site surgeries, 40 times per, per, per week. And it's not equitable. Obviously, people on the lower end of the uh, spectrum have probably the worst problems with, uh, with, uh, with, with wrong site surgeries and wrong procedures and foreign objects being left. Next slide. But it's everyone, but it's certainly not equitable. Next slide. We should have aim for zero harm. We get the equity, but you should have zero harm when it, and it should be safe for everyone. Next slide. And so now it's gone up to 50 times per week. Next slide. As far as wrong site surgeries. For a lot of reasons. Scheduling preoperative uh, area where you have missing documents or where you mock a patient, then you put drapes over it. All distractions. Next slide. So the challenges continue. Next slide, as we try to get to equity. Now I'll highlight this is that if you look at 200 bed hospital, you can expect 358 falls per year, irrespective of what you do. Next slide. And then if you have a 400 bed hospital, then it obviously goes up exponentially. 659 falls, 216 injuries, 2.4 million uh, in costs. And next slide. And we're talking about obviously death, permanent harm and severe temporary harm. Next slide. So again, next slide. So next slide, we highlighted that, but a lot of them in, in my specialty, my discipline, which is obviously surgery, unintended post-op complications and all that. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. And next slide. So quality. I would say quality and equity. Next slide. If you look at the trends affecting healthcare disparities, the healthcare disparities of the population is, is the top of the list. Next slide. And when we say that, obviously safety is there too. Next slide. Next slide. Well, this, they published this, and I'm not going to dwell on, on safety, but I, this is key. Next slide. We have 98, up to 98,000 deaths per year just based on mistakes made and two errors per day in each ICU. Next slide. And then obviously over the course of time, people like to compare medicine to, to, to aviation. That's like having a sold out 747 jet, crashing every three days, killing everyone on board. That's the amount of uh, mistakes we make at 44,000 low number uh, per year based on errors. Next slide. Next slide. They're saying, and then I'll get off this as far as safety, and we still, that's part of the equity. It has to be safe for everyone. Uh, we're less safe, next slide, 
Next slide. Then the nuclear industry. In fact, next slide. You're safer going to a zoo than going into a hospital setting. Next slide. Well, we have a public that 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 is not obviously comfortable. They mistrust. They they're worried about obviously participation of, in an environment, training and and experimenting. Next slide. So they go and look at ways of trying to find the best hospitals to, to the lay journal. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. Well, one of the ways, and then I would like to put this as a possibility to achieve uh, healthcare is to enhance our IT so that we can be able to manage the scientific knowledge. In the 20th century, it doubled every 10 years. Next slide. I don't look at how bright the people are on this in this symposium. It triples each decade in the country. Next slide. You're not going to be able to get a six sigma, which is what means less than four mistakes per uh, uh, a million occurrences. That's, we can't achieve that. We can't. It's not equitable. We can't achieve it. Next slide. And so the bottom line is that obviously what we're talking about is unacceptable. I'll put it ahead of this list that it's not equitable, but even if it's equitable, we have issues we need to take care of. Next slide. Next slide. What will make a good industry? You look at healthcare industry, industry uh, it, it's, it's consolidation, cost effectiveness, and advanced information system. Next slide. Next slide. We, we would expect, I would expect the information technology to be able to bring health information and health care to everyone that is equitable because the technology is helping us with that. But that's not the case. Next slide. I already mentioned it, it does not reduce uh, 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 errors. We have not a reduction of, of, of errors and there's no safety, no enhanced safety. Next slide. Well, again, the most basic component, electronic health medical record. Next slide. Our utilization of that is less than less than twenty percent. Next slide. And so I look at the obviously the I, the IT related deaths. Next slide. And next slide. Next slide. And next slide. So you look at the IT involved. Obviously, the most com important component, the basic component, I should say, is electronic health record, and we're all using that, hoping that we can be able to spread that and make. Healthcare more equitable, but it's not a it's it's, it's not a, a very uh, 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 good a, a advancement to be able to do that when all the problems that that I've highlighted. Next slide. Next slide. Well, there's a lot of problems with it. I won't do the, the, the interface between the patient and the and the, and the the electronics. That's the problem. Test results were not stored. In a structural format to be able to facilitate reporting and tracking the data. Next slide. Well, again, I, I will wind up because I want to emphasize the theme. Next slide. We have widening healthcare disparities. We have obviously it is it's certainly not equitable. Um, I'm hoping that this symposium. I'm looking forward to the Q and A. I hope we'll be able to put a spotlight on this and find a way. We have the money. I don't think we have the technology. I don't think it's safe, but we have to be able to obviously find a way to address healthcare so it's equitable, irrespective of where you might be on the map. Thank you very much. Thank you. Put me on. There we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Bridgman. So many uh, challenges and issues and questions raised um, with with what you brought for us. Um, maybe to start with just a, the first basic question: What do you see is the personal responsibility and role of the surgeon in addressing disparities, either locally or nationally? How can we should we get involved in? Mm -hmm. The main responsibility is to be able to go to the community. We need to go beyond the walls of the hospital, go beyond the walls of the medical school, 
be involved with the community, set up clinics. We have done a, we haven't done an optimal job there. And we're not going to be able to achieve equity unless we do that. That might help with a follow-up question with the trust issue. I mean, can, can you tell us how we might be able to reach that sort of uh, distrust that many people in the community have for especially lately with the medical uh, world? Yeah, we need to be able to be transparent with the patients. We need to bring the patient to the table and let them know what we're dealing with and be transparent. I don't think they understand it. Sometimes we don't have the health literacy, not that they're not obviously very bright, but they don't understand what we're saying. So we're not gonna be able to address it until they, they're on the same page. So that's our responsibility. It's not the patient's responsibility, it's our responsibility. Good question. Yeah. Um, so given all of those things that you sort of raised, how do we as a subspecialty in surgery start to prioritize, define and prioritize uh, maybe how we to begin to d address some of these disparities? We need it embedded in our curriculum. It should be part of our M&Ms. It should be part of our grand rounds. We should have lectures on it. And when somebody presents a case, you have to say, well, was this done in, a, in a, was this equity? Was there any violation as far as safety? We need to emphasize. We don't have to do it like a crazy uncle and hide them in the attic. We need to bring it out and talk about it. Yeah, I think that raises a, in, in the work that you did associated with your NIH grant, it, it showed uh, basically a review of the literature that looked at all the surgical subspecialties and the um, uh, work that was done identifying disparities and identifying quality measures, very, very few in the field of otolaryngology. So we definitely have a ways to go, but um, I think that some of the work that you've done with your NIH grant is, is sort of a good, uh, roadmap for other specialties to start working in that area. I'll someone will tell you what the results are. At the end of the day, what is key is that is we don't have optimal access. If we can improve access, then obviously we will, we will not have some of the disparities that we have. So improving access is really making it equitable. So it's a perfect thing. And we came up with that, that outcome that is just suboptimal access. So you mentioned going out to the community. That's that's one way. I think telehealth is another excellent way to start addressing some of those access issues. What else? What other yeah, ideas would you have? Part of IT I'm talking about. Yes, you have electronic health record, but we have more advanced technology than that. The 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 business arena is using it. We should be much more advanced in telemedicine than we are. Yeah, it seemed like it. We. It, we needed the uh, the COVID crisis to really cook us into gear when it came to that. It but showed us that before we maybe were in IT then. Yeah. Um, let me see what other questions are coming through. Uh, Anna, you can definitely help. Um, I should have mentioned my co-moderator is is with us, and she's helping to. Uh, uh, sort through some of the questions. Um, here's another one. Um, given that insurer and insured status is such a significant driver for access and for disparities in general, what can we as mere mortals do to reduce that factor? I mean, how can well, we help patients in that if area? If you look at all the driving forces, the most important determining factor is poverty. And so uh, we need to be able to spread our resources. These centers of excellence need to have some sort of uh, uh, ability to have people come to a hospital that has a center of excellence, whether it's otology or what, and make sure that the doors are open for everyone. These centers of excellence, they don't include everybody, uh, particularly people who don't have insurance. So we need to be able to open the door. Yeah. Um, let's see. How about let's talk about medical students. Uh, we, you know, we really want to recruit more students uh, from diverse backgrounds into our subspecialty. I mean, it's 
it's uh, fairly limited in medical school, it's fairly limited in surgical, and it's very limited in otolaryngology. What do you think we could do to uh, uh, helping and kind of raise awareness or to encourage medical students from underrepresented minorities into our subspecialty? We need to go to the colleges and some of the high schools. Some of the colleges, there's some colleges that put, bring out good students. We need to let them know that there's a place for them. We can't wait until medical school. We need to go a, 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 a step before that, and maybe a step before that, certainly, certainly college for sure. And I don't think we've done a good job there. We're getting better, but we need to have role models there. All right. Yeah. And develop them within our own doors as well. Right. Um, Here's a question from Dr. Shadra Shaker. Uh, great question. The bazillionaire, Mark Cuban, pointed out that in every hospital CEO's office, he sees blueprints for expansive uh, expansions that are not addressing equity, but rather about, I don't know, spending extra money. That's my two cents on it. But how do we address this problem, the mismatch between the CEOs of big hospitals and what our patients really need. I, I, I put the blame on the boys. The boys are allowing this to happen. I'm talking about the boys of the hospitals. In fact, you have some CEOs that you mentioned CEOs making $8 million a year. That's, 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 not, that's, that's not right. We need to have the boys responsible for making sure that their hospital center, although they're making, having, making unbelievable profits, they need to make sure that they're an asset to the community. And that's not being done. So I put the responsibility on the boards. A lot of the boards are community boards. They're people of the, of the, of the community and they need to speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. What are your thoughts on the United States? This is from Natalie Kuhn. Um, what are your thoughts on the United States having the highest level of maternal mortality rates amongst developed nations? It's, un it's unacceptable. I'm, I'm talking about in places like Boston and Norfolk, we shouldn't have infant mortality rate that high, but but we're not, the, the prenatal care, the nutrition, all those things we should be addressing. A lot of the patients obviously present late, so they have a high chance of maternal and fetal mortality rates. We need to do a better job at obviously getting the information out, uh, having them have access earlier, things that we haven't done. And so to answer your question, it's unacceptable. It's embarrassing. It's an embarrassment. Yeah. Remember that we're the wealthiest nation of all time. Even you compare us to the British Empire and the Roman Empire. And you're telling me we can't provide care for our, our citizens? Yes, shocking. Uh, Dr. Mara Cazzetti asked, what are the other barriers to access? besides perhaps insurance, is expertise a barrier? Uh, the barriers sometimes, as I said before, sometimes the, the, the center of excellence does not have open door for people. And so that needs to be, be transparent. And then we need to talk about it. We need to let people know that they, they, they can come in. We need to have, as I said, healthcare outside of the walls of the hospital, outside of the medical schools, in the communities have alliances, have partnerships with the churches, the, the community leaders. That's what we need to do. And from Angela Salar, how can we address ins insurance making medical decisions versus the doctor? How can we address insurance making medical decisions? We, it's, it's, right now, we need to take it back. Uh, the, the, the insurance companies have too much say. And what they're looking at is the bottom line. We went wrong when we made medicine a business. Medicine was never meant to be a business. Yes, we have fiduciary responsibility. Yes, we need to be uh, uh, financially stable, but it's never meant to be a multi-billion trillion dollar industry. So we need to be able to look at what are our priorities. And then I think that would address that question. And this is a question from Kathleen Brill, it's hard to know when doctors are correct and when they are in danger of making mistakes for various reasons. How can patients be more confident? 
Well, they can be confident by the doctors saying they made a mistake. In other words, I really do think we're not talking with the patients. The patients, are, they're pretty sophisticated. But talk to them. Let them know that there are complications. Let them know that there was a mild occurrence or something happened. Make them comfortable. But you're not going to make them comfortable by obviously excluding important data, hiding things, not being transparent. And uh, this one is from Diogor8. How can we use research in surgical care to decrease disparities? I think we talked well, about this. Um, what I'm doing, which is research, looking at ways to be able to define disparities. Most people don't understand disparities. And then find out what's the most important, what's the sensitive disparity sensitive metric, and then get a strategy to go against it, to mitigate it. That's what we need to do whether it's the surgical specialties or the medical specialties, there's not one specialty as I highlighted in my talk that doesn't have disparities, that has equity when it comes to healthcare. Not one specialty, not psychiatry, not medicine, and certainly not surgery. Yes. Um, here's another question from Dr. Chandra Shaker. Uh, we touched on some of this, but maybe this gives you an opportunity to to make a few more points. ENT has a huge diversity uh, problem amongst our physicians. How do we address this uh, for better patient access and safety? Again, and I call it as oleoryngology, head and neck, but it is a huge this, this, uh, diversity problem amongst their physicians. Um, think about it. We have a pipeline problem. We're not getting physicians in the pipeline with diverse backgrounds. Even when they get in the pipeline, they don't want all the loans, so they're not going to choose. They're going to try, try to choose a, a specialty uh, and maybe ENT, but they, they, they are choosing it not for necessarily taking care of patients in their communities. They're choosing to be able to take care of the burden, the loan burden that they have. So we need to, we need to, to, to balance that. So we need to enhance the pipeline by the things I mentioned about going to colleges and high schools. But we, it should be based on people wanting to do medicine, not necessarily to make money, but to go into specialties where we need them, primary care. Heidi, uh, yeah, great. So Heidi Breit uh, said, just listening to the patient is huge. It's important to remember that we all know our own bodies and when something is wrong. Well, we're putting the onus, you point, can you're putting the onus on the patient. If something's wrong with your body, then obviously seek medical attention. The problem is they get blocked because they don't have money, they don't have insurance, and so they come to the emergency department in a delayed fashion. So there's no way you'll be able to get early intervention. But I give you're right. If the responsibility is on the patient, but sometimes they have they they can't they can't get access to the uh, healthcare center, and the most they can do is go to urgent care center. Yes. Okay. Um, see if there's any last comments, but I think we are. Uh, here's a good one. Um, there's a couple of good ones. Uh, Haynes here asks, what have you and your team done to improve patient and physician acceptance of telehealth? Well, it's a requirement. Uh, we, we train on telehealth now. Uh, we're a community-based medical school, and so our job is to be in the community. What helps us, as you highlighted, is being able to be a, a master of telemedicine. So we work hard on that. Um, we do it because we're responsible. This medical school started because of the community. So we cannot abandon the community. So I think we're doing a good job, but we could do a better job. Yeah. And I see a really good question from Jonathan Taylor, but I think I'm going to hold on that uh, for for that one for the last couple of speakers. But we have another excellent question from Dr. Redleaf. On the ground level, patient by patient, the impoverished patient is harder to treat, harder to get them in, more hassles, more no-shows. Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I do. And I'm going to highlight this again. We have to form partnerships. Let's form partnerships with the communities, with the churches, with the leaders, Urban League, and have them be our partners in, in making sure that these patients are not hard to get in, that they're not hassles. And they're willing to do it. They want to do more, too. Yeah. 
And I think we're gonna talk about that. So that's a great segue. Uh, but one last question uh, from Dr. Uh, Chandra Shaker again. The data about infant mortality by provider uh, race is horrifying. How do we get docs and nurses to see their own implicit biases and change? Right now, that's part of the curriculum in most medical schools, implicit bias. Um, um, that's something that we, we talk about. We, it's part of the curriculum. So we'll see. Uh, we didn't talk about it before. It was, it was something that we didn't, we, we, we avoided. But we know we have our own biases. Not that we're racist, but we have our own biases. We need to be able to correct for that. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Britt. Such a great conversation and more to come uh, for sure. We really appreciate you being here with us. Okay. Um, I'm thank going you. to, thank you. I'm gonna introduce Dr. Anna Kim and uh, she will then uh, bring in the next phase of our uh, conversation with our uh, additional guest speakers. And um, I will pass it to you, Dr. Kim. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Brett and Stephanie. What a great kickoff to a, a wonderful evening. So good evening, everybody. Healthcare disparities are often viewed through the optics of race and socioeconomic status but they also occur at a broader dimension that, that, that's not always so intuitive, such as age, health disabilities such as hearing loss, and geography where super specialized care such as otology can be difficult to access for a variety of reasons. For instance, a 2008 study showed that about 86% of general physicians don't routinely test their patient's hearing. And it's estimated that only about 20% of those under 70 years of age have a hearing test in, in the past five years. And that only a fraction of them go on to uh, get a hearing aid or can they even afford a hearing aid. This evening, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Anil Lawani, who will share how his team is tackling hearing loss and the pediatric population in Washington Heights in New York City and Dr. Carrie Neiman, who will share her efforts to address hearing loss in the elderly population in the Baltimore, Maryland area. First, Dr. Leo Luwani. Dr. Luwani is an Associate Dean for Student Research, Professor and Vice Chair for Research, and Co-Director of the Cochlear Implant Program in the Department of Otolaryngology at Columbia University Medical Center. In addition, he serves as, a, as the medical director of perioperative services at New York Presbyterian Columbus campus. He has served as the president of American Neurotology Society and the American Auditory Society. Dr. Lawani is considered a leading expert on hearing loss in children and adult, adults. He has authored more than 235 peer reviewed articles numerous book chapters and textbooks defining the subspecialty of pediatric otology and neurotology. He serves on the editorial board of numerous leading otolaryngology journals. And with that, I now turn the podium to Dr. Lawani. Well, Dr. Kim, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I want to take a moment to thank the ANS and AOS and putting this wonderful forum on achieving equity in surgical and hearing health care. And I'm especially pleased to talk about our uh, program, our Community Hearing Health Collaborative. If I can have my uh, slides, that'd be fantastic. So it's really a privilege for me uh, to be part of this forum tonight. I'd like to talk to you about our program on Community Hearing Health Worker Initiative to support children uh, with hearing loss. I wanna declare some of the disclosures as shown here, and I wanna take a moment to really highlight the funding from over counter Foundation since 2018. The foundation is really committed to all children who are deaf or hard of hearing. They feel that they should all have the opportunity to reach their full potential. And much of the focus of our, our program is in fact to realize this dream. So if you look at the epidemiology of hearing loss in children, nearly two out of 1,000 newborns are diagnosed with hearing loss annually. Now the good news is because of the implementation of infant hearing screening programs nearly two decades ago, these children are being diagnosed early, in fact at birth at most places in our country. 
However, uh, realizing the full potential requires a complex coordination of care. And this access to and quality of care varies by some household characteristics, which we're very interested in talking about tonight, including poverty, educational attainment, and the English language proficiency of the family. Now, what are some of the social determinants of health? Now, we've talked about the health care and access, and let me just say, without access, there is no equity. We can't talk about quality unless there's access. But that really only contributes to 20%. And this is often the part that we as physicians tend to focus on. But equally important, of course, are behavioral issues or behavioral lifestyle issues that contribute another third, like such as exercising, smoking, or substance abuse related to other disorders. But the thing that we don't often focus on uh, that really directly more than maybe some studies are recommended more than half are the social determinants of health. And broadly speaking, this includes housing, education, employment, food, transportation, safety, social connections. In fact, Dr. Redleaf asked, how can we get these patients to the hospital more often, not to be a no-show, is because as physicians, we often underappreciate the difficulty of simply finding a, finding a babysitter, getting a transportation, being able to afford the transportation to come to a physician. And it is these things that we really have to focus on uh, for if we're gonna make an impact. So really addressing the, uh, the social determinants of health is fundamental, I think, to improving health and reducing the long-standing inequities in health. And it requires actions by all of us. So while we address these social uh, determinants, we can improve outcome, we can save money in the process, enhance value, but most importantly, reduce health inequities while we have a positive impact on health outcome. And that's really the most critical thing. Next slide, please. So how about the social determinants of health and in children with hearing loss? Well, we, we stated earlier that children with hearing loss require a complex coordination of care that takes extensive effort from parents. In low socioeconomic groups, the parents often report difficulty navigating the healthcare system and lack of confidence in decision-making. And all the socioeconomic determinants that we just talked about, in fact, have a negative impact on this confidence in parents. As a result, children with hearing loss, especially from low uh, socioeconomic status populations, have delayed diagnosis of hearing loss, late initiation of hearing devices, whether it's hearing aids or cochlear implants, and there's also non-adherence to early intervention. And if you take a look at children who have special health care needs outside of hearing loss, and if you look at the families with or without hearing loss of these children with special needs, you find that the families with children who have special needs and hearing loss are even more handicapped and come from very disadvantaged backgrounds, including they're more likely to be below high school, they're more likely to be publicly insured, uh, they're more likely to be on the poverty line, and often they come from home. There are non-English speaking. And this lower socioeconomic status and health literacy, of course, significantly impacts medical care overall, so much so that these families of, of special need children who also have hearing loss are less likely to have quality care as well as access to community services. They're less likely to have family-centered medical care. They don't have as easy problems with medical referrals that they might need. There isn't the effective care coordination in the medical home. And most importantly, they do not are unable to access the community services and there is absence of good transition of care. So, um, how about cochlear implants, the subject that's dear to all of us? Now, it turns out if you look at uh, patients that are have private insurances versus Medicaid, the literature suggests now that there may be, in fact, equal access early on. But the families that have Medicaid, as opposed to private insurance, they have a lot, many more complications from cochlear implantation. Uh, they're more likely, possibly secondary to non-adherence, to follow-ups, as again, Dr. Redleaf talked about earlier, uh, 
And they also find that there is, in fact, a delay in often not getting a second sequential bilateral cochlear implant in the Medicaid population. And in fact, one of the predictors of how early a cochlear implant occurs is really the infant hearing screening. So there's the greater the delay in infant hearing screening, the greater the delay in getting a cochlear implant. It's one of the reasons that our program has really focused on infant hearing screening and making sure that any child that fails goes on to get a follow-up. And we'll talk about that as well. So how about our neighborhood at Columbia? Well, you're probably really excited about watching the movie In the Heights. Well, Columbia is located in the Washington Heights in the Bronx, uh, where half the families have an education level, a parent education level below high school. Uh, 83% are publicly insured by things like Medicaid, and nearly half of the primary caregiver, the father, the mother, work outside the home in addition to caring for their children. Now, if you look at the, um, the ethnic background, about 80% of the families consider them, uh, identify themselves as Latinx. About the same percentage are non-primary English speaking. And if you look at that circle, that's where the Bronx area is, uh, where there's, there's uh, Manhattan to your left and the Queens area below us. So if you look at the socioeconomic status, vast majority of these families are in significant poverty and are in the, in the bottom quartile of socioeconomic status. And if you look at the income levels, the median household income, they're often at or below the poverty level. So this is a socioeconomically disadvantaged area uh, around Colombia. And so when we look at this population and the po this data that we collected through our community health workers, families of children with hearing loss in our area, nearly half of them did not uh, receive the therapeutic services such as speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy before the intervention by a community health worker. Nearly all of them did not get all the community services that they could have had access to, whether it was SSI, uh, food stamps, and so on. So the access issue is huge. Understanding how to navigate the landscape to get access to whether it's community services or medical services is a big problem for people in our area. And it was with this in mind that we came up with the Children Hearing Health Collaborative back in 2017 and subsequently has been supported by the Obercotter Foundation. When I was having my baby, my, my wife and I were having our first child nearly 30 years ago now. You know, one of the things that I was really afraid of is having a child with hearing loss because I had no idea what I would need to do. And here I was a hearing specialist. And this is one of the motivations for coming up with this program to help families uh, in our neighborhood. So what is this program? What are the characteristics? Well, the, corner store, the cornerstone of this program, the Community Hearing Health Collaborative, is a community health worker that I'm gonna tell you about some more in just a few moments. The goal was to identify barriers to treatment and challenges, connect families to resources through trusted peer support and advocacy. And we put together a very strong, very committed, very passionate multidisciplinary team composed of audiologists, speech pathologists, uh, deaf and uh, hard of hearing educational experts, otologists, general pediatricians, community health workers, community health managers, and most importantly, community partners. Now, the most important thing we wanted to make sure we got across is this is not a Columbia program. This is not a New York Presbyterian program, but simply a resource for the community. So it doesn't matter if you're being treated at Albert Einstein, at Mount Sinai, at NYU, if you have a child that needs our support, we would provide a community health worker to your family that can help them navigate the community and medical resources necessary. And that's really important. So how about the community health worker? Well, we were quite fortunate to be at the institution we're at because NYP already had a very strong record uh, in community hospital partnership through the Center for Community Health Navigation. And they had extensive experiences working with the community health worker 
in areas of obesity, uh, asthma in children, as well as uh, high blood pressure for adults. So we were quite lucky that, that our institution had a lot of experience in this area. So these community health workers are hired through a community-based organization. So even though they're paid through our salary lines, they're actually hired by a community-based organization that is uh, works in the community. They're fully integrated into the healthcare teams. They bridge the hospital and the community setting for the, uh, the patient and the family. They're bilingual and culturally sensitive. Um, and most importantly, we came up with a curriculum, a special curriculum that would uh, teach them not only about early childhood development, but also about hearing loss. So that was really critical in um, arming our community health workers so they could partner with our families as well as our healthcare team. So what, what, what does our community health worker, what does our program do? Well, we, we divide it into two different things. One's called light navigation and the other is care coordination. So light navigation is where any child that fails infant hearing screening is immediately connected to a community health worker. And in fact, before COVID and hopefully soon after COVID's gone, they would actually go and meet with the family before they were discharged. They rounded with the team on the well care nursery as well as the NICU to make sure that this resource, that our team knew that this resource was available. So the community health worker would then work with the family to reinforce the idea why audiology follow-up is so important, why testing was so important and establishing a medical home was important. And so they made sure that they got, came back to screening early and all the time. And if they passed the infant hearing screen a second time, then we signed off and, and they no longer needed follow-up. On the other hand, if they did fail the hearing test again or the hearing screening and they had a hearing loss, they would move on to the care coordination where the community health worker would go to their home to assess the environment, the social determinants, and to build a trust with the family. They would help them with all the appointments, not just medical appointments, but also social services, school appointments, early intervention, really anything they needed, getting food stamps and stuff, uh, such as social service referrals. They empower the families to understand the disease process and what's important. They empower them by letting them know what's out there for the families and there for their child. And they have an ongoing peer-based education support. And during the pandemic, they were a key resource providing information about COVID-19, uh, how to get tested and all that, all so on. Uh, next slide. So even prior to our experience with the hearing loss families, based on our prior experience, the non-hearing loss community health worker programs, we knew that the CHWs could significantly decrease parental distress about the disease. They increased access to food and housing resources, and they really led to significant improvement in understanding of diagnoses. And we found something very similar when we look at our own data for the hearing loss community health worker program that we have. By three months of enrollment in our program, 70% of families had necessary service referrals completed, nearly 90% had health care goals met, and significantly more uh, children had hearing aids as well as cochlear implants compared to uh, historical controls. But during this COVID pandemic, it became clear that there was a huge digital divide. That's not surprising given what I told you about the socioeconomic status of all our families in the Bronx area. But one of the things you have to know is nearly half a million New York City households lack internet access. So if you look at that map in the upper left-hand corner where the Bronx is, nearly more than a third of homes do not have internet. And in an era when televisit was becoming the only thing that allowed you connection with the family, this of course was untenable. So one of the innovations that we came up with is the concept of a tele-CHW. That is a, a CHW who is an expert in telehealth, whether it's any sorts of IT help, telemedicine. And so during the pandemic, our CHWs made sure that families could hook could sign on to the patient portals. We helped them obtain tablets and devices. It also allowed us to expand our geographic reach because now we could connect to these families uh, via telemedicine. 
And so one of the key things I think going forward is uh, this, this, this position of a TELUS CHW that will not only interact with our program with providing resources to other CHWs, but really providing resources to families. Well, uh, there's other lessons. These it's really important in terms of getting food insecurities, diapers and tech supports as well. And finally, now we're just putting the data together to show the positive impact and outcomes. We think there's an opportunity to expand this nationwide. And if you can show the last slide for me, I wanna thank the team. This, without this team, none of this has been possible. Dr. Matisse and, and uh, Patricia Peretz, these are national and international figures in community health workers and their role in health delivery. Andy Neto, Christy Medina, Andrew Palenko, uh, Maria, and of course, our Columbia team, Megan Kame, which is our superb audiologist who's in charge of audiology, Stacey Bernstein, speech and language pathologist, Melissa Oliver, our educational specialist, and Stephen Leong, who's a medical student helping us. So thank you. Thanks, Anil. Really exciting work you're doing on behalf of our community, you and your team. So next we'll move on to Dr. Carrie Neiman. She is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins in the Department of Otolaryngology and core faculty at the Johns Hopkins Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health. Her career is devoted to the development, implementation, and dissemination of public health-driven solutions that ensure access to effective communication for the growing older adult population. Dr. Neiman is a co-founder of Access Hears, which is a non-for-profit program committed to delivering affordable, accessible hearing care. And she will share some of her work with the program with us this evening. Dr. Neiman. Great, thank you very much. Excellent. So wait a second here as the slides come up. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Perfect. So we are going to continue a little bit further down the age continuum. And I hope to continue that question about what can we do when it comes to, to being otologists and answering some of these things around hearing health equity. So I have no financial disclosures here um, that to share, but to get us in the mindset, when we're talking about health equity, we really need to step outside of kind of our medical perspective, where we're usually talking about one-on-one -on -one care, where we spend a lot of our time thinking about that patient in front of us. And what we need to do is shift to a public health perspective. When we are thinking about how do we provide hearing care to all of the older adults at a population level. And while that medical perspective is really important, the public health perspective also needs to come alongside that, especially when we're thinking about issues around equity. So we'll briefly talk about the current status of what we know about older Americans in terms of hearing care disparities. And then we'll talk a bit about our role as researchers and clinicians. So the current status, when we look at a population level and we know that hearing loss is common and we know that age-related hearing loss really makes up the bulk of the hearing loss burden at a public health level. So if we look at the United States, 38 million individuals across the US have some degree of hearing loss. Of that 38 million, over 28 million of those are older Americans. And the other thing that we know that it doesn't really surprise any of us is that hearing aid use is only around 15 to 20 percent among individuals who have a clinically significant hearing loss. And we know that the vast majority of hearing loss at, again, a population level is a mild to moderate degree of hearing loss. So when we look at nationally representative data, we start to see some of evidence in terms of disparities. And we see by race, ethnicity, that disparities exist. We're only around 10% of older Americans who have hearing loss in terms of racial ethnic minorities, primarily African-American, Mexican-American, older adults, only around 10% use hearing aids. When we look at another cohort, not nationally representative, we see differences, again, by race, ethnicity, as well as socioeconomic status. And the other thing that we can look at is that these numbers really haven't changed with time. We see in particular among African-American men and women in terms of older adults that their proportion of hearing aid users really hasn't grown at all. And that's particularly true for African-American men. So we know disparities exist, 
but we actually know very little in terms of when it comes to intervention because relatively few studies include minority older adults when it comes to hearing care. So if we look at the past 30 years of hearing related studies among adults and older adults, less than 13% of those studies actually even report race ethnicity. And we look at among those who actually do report race ethnicity, only five included greater than 30% racial ethnic minority representation. So we know very little when it comes to addressing older adults hearing loss, particularly when it comes to thinking about populations that may be underserved by our clinic-based approaches. So I'll now switch into sharing just some thoughts on what can be our role potentially as researchers and clinicians. And I think a lot of what I'll share here is really just to share some of our experience in Baltimore with the program here. And this is much more on the research side. I know there's some mention around the nonprofit side, but this is what we're doing on the research side of things. And so what we're doing here is by no means meant to be comprehensive in answering how do we achieve hearing health equity for our older adults, but I think it carries on a lot of the themes that Dr. Britt and Dr. Lawani brought up in terms of we need to think beyond our traditional clinic-based approaches to hearing care. That's particularly true when it comes to older adults. How can we look to public health in terms of all the different approaches that have been used in other disciplines and other fields to address disparities? How can we partner with community health workers, models of care? How can we use new and evolving affordable over-the-counter technology? Because that's really what we're called to do if we're going to advance hearing health equity for our older adults. So I'll share a little bit about what we're doing with HEARS. So what is HEARS? HEARS is a two-hour theory-driven intervention that goes through a uh, basics of hearing care, and it's designed to be delivered by a community health worker. When I say community health worker, that's a really broad term. And here, for HEARS, we're talking about older adult peer mentors who meet with another older adult who has hearing loss and goes through this structured two-hour program, helps them get fitted with some over-the-counter hearing technology. When we designed the HEARS intervention, we tried from the very beginning to think about how can we systematically remove as many barriers as possible. So the entire program and the entire research program, every step of the way, is delivered completely within a community-based setting. So that two-hour program goes through a step-by-step -step fitting and orientation to an over-the-counter hearing device as a choice of the older adult themselves. And it's partnered with some basic oral rehabilitation in terms of communication strategies and expectation management. Here is just an example of what our older adult peer mentors kind of look like in action in terms of their training. So in our initial pilot study, we found that for individuals who again received this two hour intervention using an over the counter listening device designed to be delivered by a community health worker or older adult peer mentor, we found improvements in communication function that were on par with what we see in terms of gold standard hearing aids fit by an audiologist. And that's what led us to continue our work in terms of a larger randomized controlled trial now ongoing in the Baltimore area. So in this larger randomized controlled trial, we were testing does a model of hearing care that's designed specifically for older adults, that's delivered completely outside of a clinic setting by older adult peer mentors in less than two hours using over-the-counter technology, does it work? And so to, the, the research question is, does community-delivered hearing care improve communication function three months post-intervention as compared to no treatment? That's what the trial um, is designed to answer. So to help answer that question, our initial cohort, our sample size was around 100 adults, um, older adults, based on our sample size calculations. In the end, we randomized over 150 individuals. And that due, was due in part for two reasons. We had the capacity, but because every step of this trial was done in partnership with our community partners, there was an expectation that we were going to provide as much care as possible to meet the, the expectations of our team members in terms of our community partners. So I'm gonna first share a little bit about who our cohort looks like, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we got to that cohort. Again, thinking about what can we do to get outside of our traditional clinic-based care and clinic-based models of research. So our cohort consists, again, 151 individuals, not huge numbers, but when it comes to hearing-related trials, 
This is on the larger side in terms of when we see around 43% of the older adults with hearing loss who were recruited in this trial self-identified as African-American or Black. Again, those numbers may seem small, but to date, that represents one of the largest cohorts of African-American older adults with hearing loss. And then when we look in terms of income, two-thirds of all individuals in this trial identified as, as low income. Again, one of the largest cohorts today of low income older adults. And so how did we go about doing this? We screened over 348 individuals in order to get that, that 151 in terms of our cohort. We partnered and operated at 13 community sites across the Baltimore City area and Baltimore County, primarily working with affordable senior housing, as well as a number of community centers and senior centers. This took place over 18 months, as you can see, all pre-COVID, two research assistants and one research coordinator to make it happen. So to do that, we did a total of 19 information sessions kind of all around the place. We had 25 pop-ups, which would be a casual kind of, you know, um, little have food and have hearing screening available. And then 14 joint community events where we were actually hosting events with our community partners, whether Valentine's Day lunch or whatnot, partner meetings and health fairs. So a total of 77 events over those 18 months. In partnership with that, we also use culturally informed flyers and posters. This just gives you a flavor of some of what we used. Every single step in terms of our flyers, posters, were all provided with feedback from our community partners in terms of who was displayed, what relationships were gonna be displayed, um, the language that was gonna be used, the fact that it was gonna be important that every um, older adult, they were going to try to be pictured with a the device themselves, and that as the research team, the face of the research team was truly the older adult peer mentors and they needed and wanted to be front and center in terms of the Meet the Hears team. So we had 77 events, three staff. That equated to 470 staff hours total in order to recruit those 151 individuals. So a little over an hour of recruitment effort for one screened individual and over three hours of recruitment effort to randomize one individual. I think these are the types of numbers that we don't always think about in terms of what it takes in order to execute trials if we're going to have a representative sample and to reach those who may not traditionally be interested in working um, with an academic setting, particularly one like Hopkins. So as I've said throughout, and as Dr. Britt talked about, as Dr. Luwani talked about, our community partners have to be at the heart of what we're doing in terms of a community advisory board, our community organizations. We also have a human-centered designer who's embedded throughout our trial. And these core concepts of trust, partnership, reciprocity, respect, flexibility, commitment, Yes, these are all words we hear time and time again that have to be part of research, but these cannot just be words. They have to be something that you live and breathe throughout the process of how you engage from the very idea that you may have and the grant goes in. Um, and it can't really be emphasized enough. So what can we do? This list by no means again is meant to be comprehensive. As researchers, we need to make sure that when appropriate, we need to be reporting self-identified race ethnicity because we just don't know enough in terms of where we are and who is missing from our research. We need to consider who is not at the table and who is not necessarily there, and then to work on dedicated recruitment efforts. There are many disciplines who have done much better than ours in order to how do we partner with community organizations, how do we recruit individuals from diverse backgrounds that to collaborate across disciplines is a really important partner because we do not have to do this alone. As clinicians, we need to understand our biases that are part of our training and our practice and to recognize them and work to counteract them. And I know I didn't touch on those aspects of this, um, but they are things that we can think about in terms of hearing health equity and making sure we are doing our part. I think the two most important things, um, maybe not most important, but I think particularly relevant to keep in mind is that we do need to be comfortable with discussing more affordable hearing options. There are a wealth of over-the-counter devices out there. People look to us in terms of our patients, in terms of a trusted source of information, and there are a lot of great devices out there, but we need to help connect and provide options regardless of where our individual patients may be in their journey in terms of hearing.
And the last that I think really has to go hand in hand when we talk about task sharing or these community health worker partnered models of care is that we as physicians and audiologists, we need to make sure we are leveraging our role as gatekeepers in order to advance equity. We are at a really important point um, in, in history in terms of when it comes to hearing healthcare. In 2016, we had the National Academies report on the hearing healthcare for adults. That laid out a number of different recommendations. It laid out the need for more models of care, community delivered models that partner with community health workers in addition to things like over-the-counter hearing aids. Then quickly followed in 2017, the passage of over-the-counter hearing aids legislation. I know a lot to be determined there, but it is something that is certainly coming. And in 2021, we had the first ever world report on hearing, which again called out a number of different recommendations, including task sharing and community health workers. We need to recognize the power that we have as gatekeepers in terms of controlling the door, in terms of scope of practice, and what it may mean in terms of hearing health equity for all of our patients. We play an important role and we have a big decision to make in terms of whether we partner with others in terms of community health workers, audiologists, and patients and community organizations to help open the doors and really leverage all of these things that are coming together right now. That time is now and I think we have a beautiful opportunity to try and move forward. Obviously, we cannot do any of this without the teams and our community partners. So a big shout out to them and really looking forward to taking more questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. That, thank you, Dr. Lawani. We've given you the impossible task of compressing all of your hard work into 15 minutes, but both of you did a fabulous job. I just wanted to let you know, I was just scrolling through the comments. We have someone from Greece joining us this evening as well. So we have lots of questions to get to. So let's uh, dive right in. The first question goes to Dr. Lawani. Angela Salar, who is a deaf educator, is concerned about the burden of audiology and speech services and hearing devices on the schools. What can we do to transfer the burden from the school? I think, Anna, that's an excellent question. Really, when we think about hearing health in general, we find that the government often has deflected their responsibility in providing access to hearing health. Well, there are some children making sure that all the testing is available, all the follow-up record keeping is available, making sure the technology is available. And the same thing that Carrie talked about at her end, and adults, you know, Medicare specifically prohibits uh, providing for hearing aids. And so I think as a society, we really need to reframe uh, audition, hearing, as being one of the things that we want to guarantee every one of our citizens. And this really requires a government level intervention and in reprioritizing how we spend money to make sure that we do not deprive our senses, do not lead to lack of speech and language development, and at the other end, do not lead to dementia and cognitive decline. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Carrie, Angela is very uh, busy texting questions here. Angela Silver is asking your question. How do we address the need for adults to get help with cost of hearing devices? Research shows that proper hearing corrections reduce the risk for dementia. How much can we save in dementia costs by implementing hearing aids? So it's a great question. Um, and I think as, as many people are, you know, very excited about a lot of the research that's coming out in terms of a potential connection between hearing loss um, and cognitive decline. But just as I think many also know um, that we do not yet have a definitive trial that we know whether or not providing hearing care, you know, hearing aids or other options um, can actually slow cognitive decline. So we don't have that yet. Um, there is, as many people know, a large uh, randomized controlled trial going on, you know, based at Hopkins and many sites across the country called the ACHIEVE trial. We won't have those results out till 2022, 2023. So I just want to at least comment on that um, in terms of we don't know yet in terms of save costs and whatnot. Um, I think the, the goal that I think for many of us um, in terms of looking to over-the-counter hearing aids, by no means are over-the-counter hearing aids going to solve everything. But I think that the ability to have 
pressure in a marketplace um, from consumer electronics in terms of kind of taking a traditionally small volume um, kind of market to a larger volume in terms of increasing quality, decreasing increasing quality, decreasing cost, um, I think is a, a pressure that we're, we're hoping that, that the over-the-counter market will, will move towards. So that may not necessarily mean that we need for individuals mild to moderate loss, insurance coverage necessarily for some devices, um, but that when we're talking about more severe losses, that we do need insurance coverage to step in. But obviously there's a lot to be determined um, in this space. We have a question for both of you from Maura Cossetti. Both great presentations, both programs rely on foundational support. Is this tenable for wider expansion? What role might payers or hospitals play in these programs? Emil, you wanna go first? Uh, sure. Uh, so again, I wanna just thank the Obercotter Foundation. And but, but when we applied for refunding in our second round, we realized that this can't go on forever. And one of the critical things that, that our group has been working on is to integrate ourselves into the health delivery uh, through the hospital. So New York Presbyterian, for example, has an ambulatory care network that has physicians employed, uh, social work and so on, providing care in the community. What we're gonna do is to show that there is great return on investment in terms of investing in a community health workers in other programs uh, and make this available to families that have hearing loss to make sure they get back on in time for their follow-up appointments, to make sure they have their community resources and so on. So we fully expect to be part of our hospital del healthcare delivery model and not outside of it. Um, I can speak to our work in uh, here's. So the work that I shared here is NIH funded, you know, dollars at work in terms of trying to establish the evidence behind community delivered hearing care. The thing that I didn't talk about here is the nonprofit side of things, access here's. And the whole reason we founded that nonprofit is to try to help put pressure in thinking about those sustainability and scalability issues much earlier than we traditionally think of in kind of our traditional research approach. Um, and in that side of things, um, where yes, we do have some foundational support, but we do, we have met some early sustainability milestones in terms of being able to garner enough revenue to pay for the cost of um, the work that we do in Baltimore and Maryland on the nonprofit side. So definitely an important question for sure. Uh, Anil, Sujana Chandrasekhar is asking, was there a separate way that the HC team communicated with the communi community health workers to ensure that the correct info reached the patient. How was this paid? So uh, one of the key things about the community health workers is that they actually often accompany the families to their physician appointments, as well as other appointments. So they were there during the visit. But the other part that's absolutely critical is there is an ongoing dialogue between the provider and the community health worker every one of them, whether it's in the medical realm or the non-medical realm. And, um, and there's also, we also go back and actually test our families about their knowledge about hearing loss and so on to make sure is there been an impact on educational aspect of it as well. But I think the most important part will be is, is how directly they're integrated into the patient visit or other visits that these families make. Carrie, uh, Ruth Bernstein asks, are the trainees working in the Baltimore Here's Project paid? So great question. Um, in the in our in the research study, um, this was in consultation with uh, with the community health workers themselves, as well as with our community advisory board. They do receive a stipend, um, but because many of them do receive and qualify for certain government benefits related to housing and whatnot, um, they asked for uh, certain caps in terms of that they weren't going to make a certain amount of income. Um, so they do receive a stipend, but it is a smaller stipend. So it is considered primarily a volunteer role um, for, for many of our peer mentors. But again, that was done very much in close partnership with what the community health workers wanted themselves. See, Anil, Jonathan Taylor asks, New York City does not mandate school screening for hearing loss. What is the impact of that on hearing care and diversity? 
You know, Anna, that, that really speaks to a very important point. We often think that infant hearing screening at birth, if the child passes that, that's it. We don't have to worry about hearing loss for the rest of their lives. And as you know, that's just not true because as we go from 1.7 1, 1. out of 1,000 newborns with hearing loss, about five or six out of 1,000 are actually a number that's much tw almost 20 times higher have at age five or six. So there is a real need for ongoing screening for hearing loss. And it's certainly, it's, it's something that we have to work very hard towards making sure is a part of every school system in this country that there is ongoing screening much beyond infant hearing screening. Maybe, you know, when they first enter the school, maybe you're even around age 12 or 13, which is another important age for children as they go through puberty and so on. Okay, so I wanted to bring both of you up and kind of close this session with a little bit of a, um, a political <laughs> controversial uh, question, which is, uh, you know, the young and the old, and this was brought up a couple of times this evening, the young and the old are the two ends of the spectrum who really need financial support for hearing aid coverage. And they're not in the workforce, so they're not making any uh, living. And the early intervention only covers up to age three, and the Medicare population who really need support and financial support, uh, Medicare does not cover. So what can we do at a local level, at a national level? What are the physicians doing to address this deficiency? Uh, Neil, you want to go first? You know, um, as I get older, Anna, one of the things I'm realizing that I can only do so much as a doctor. And, um, you know, we, we certainly we make impact in, in individuals' lives and certainly maybe a handful of individuals through our career. But I think where I want to focus my energy really is in the legislative arena, but both locally, state level, nationally. Look, um, just I, I feel uh, nearly all of us wear glasses on this screen. Nearly all of us are going to need hearing aids at some point. It seems just wrong to me uh, and a just society not to have access to vision care and auditory care. And uh, to be honest, I, I kind of wish I'd done it for the last 30 years of my career, but my next 30 years of my life, I'm focusing entirely on expending political energy in trying to get the right thing done from our government, which is to provide the sensory <laughs> tools to enhance our sensory input uh, in our everyday experience. Yeah. Um. So I'll say from, from a cochlear center standpoint, um, a, a commitment to trying to translate a lot of research into policy is a big focus of, of what, we, what we try and do. Um, obviously it is a long process that we all need partners um, in terms of, of us as, as physicians and audiologists and you know, hearing care experts. Um, but I think you know, as we do research um, and for those as we practice I think both of those elements, we need to have that end goal of how can we affect the bigger picture. Um, and I think trying to, you know, when you publish, you know, some exciting work, trying to make it um, tangible for, for a public audience in terms of, of working within professional societies or whatnot to spread the word about the great work that is really being done across the country in lots of different places, um, I think is, is one part of it. I think there is always a lot of focus on the device, but I think another part of it needs to be the services um, that go alongside it. Um, you know, over-the-counter devices, you know, for our, many of our older adults are not something that every everybody's going to navigate to an online, you know, marketplace and, and purchase the devices themselves. That's definitely something that we've learned kind of firsthand and a lot of the reason why we need more models of care. So I think the things that we can do um, in our daily life is to think about how can we provide openness to some more models of care um, in terms of how do we ensure safe quality care by providing supervision while you know thinking about you know our scope of practice there's legislation that happens all the time um, and I think we need to be careful about what role we play in that setting because we have a powerful voice that we can use to help narrow and restrict care or we can help in terms of that bigger public health picture of what our role can be there so I, I think that's it's just thinking about both aspects for sure. 
Okay, thank you to our terrific guest speakers for sharing their research and insight this evening. I hope we can continue to have this type of dialogue. At this time, I'd like to bring back Dr. Moody for closing remarks. Thank you. I, I uh, echo the um, wonderful conversations. We had great ideas. Love uh, what everybody brought to the game. Dr. Britt provided us with an expansive overview on the status of disparities in healthcare, especially with respect to problems in access and quality in the surgical field. Uh, we will remember his uh, theme that I think uh, Emil Lawani also echoed that we will that we will without access there is no quality. Uh, Dr. Lawani, I really appreciated very much uh, your innovative solutions to managing. Uh, the effects of social determinants of health in your specific community. And Dr. Neiman, thank you for showing uh, that a hearing care program by mentors, community members, can be an effective way uh, to expand access to hearing care. Um, we've had a lot of uh, great questions and uh, we're showing a, a couple comments on screen. Bravo, a great conversation um, and appreciate everybody um, tuning in and uh, this uh, will be available online. So please uh, tweet it, share it on Facebook, uh, send it by email to friends and colleagues, community members, and uh, let's uh, keep up this conversation and find more solutions for our own communities. Thank you everybody. And thank you, Dr. Kim for your help. Thank you, Stephanie.